This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami. Uh, we're having another anesthesiology weekly hangout, hangout actually bi-monthly hangout, with uh, Rick Novak, MD, an anesthesiologist from Stanford. And Rick's given some great talks, and tonight he's going to talk about avoiding airway disasters with 20th, 21st century technology. Uh, this is a topic which uh, I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, and this is exactly why the website exists. It's, it's to, to orient people to uh, different things that are happening in different specialties and different subjects. So, so welcome, Rick. Uh, I, I put the palm trees in the background for you. Uh, those are real. Those aren't fake. So welcome, Rick. Good to see you, John. So tonight's topic is about avoiding airway disasters using the latest 21st century technologies. Every acute care physician dreads an airway disaster, whether you're an anesthesiologist, an ER doc, or an ICU doctor. Anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists are airway experts, but anesthesia professionals are often the only people in an operating room capable of keeping a patient alive if the airway is occluded or lost. Hypoxia from an airway disaster can lead to brain damage within minutes, so there's little time for human error. A fundamental skill that anesthesiologists have is the ability to assess whether a patient's airway uh, is going to be like prior to anesthesia. You have to, to decide whether the patient will pose number one, difficult bag mask ventilation, number two, uh, difficult uh, LMA placement or laryngeal mask airway placement, number three, difficult laryngoscopy, number four, difficult endotracheal intubation, or five, a difficult surgical airway. Of critical importance is number one of these, that is recognizing the patient who presents to be difficult bag mask ventilation. Conditions that make for a difficult bag mask ventilation are not very common, and they can usually be detected during the preoperative physical examination. Despite how important it is to be able to place an endotracheal tube, the skill of being able to mask ventilate is more important. Every year, I encounter several patients who are unanticipated difficult endotracheal intubations. But in each of these cases, I must be able to keep the patient oxygenated by using a mask over their face and um, ventilating oxygen in and out through their lungs with that technique. Um, most anesthesia airway disasters aren't difficult intubation cases, but they're scenarios that are classified as can't intubate and can't ventilate. In these, can't intubate, can't ventilate situations, the anesthesiology professional has only minutes to restore oxygenation to the patient or else the risk of permanent brain damage is very real. The American Society of Anesthesiologists has a document called the Difficult Airway Algorithm. It's available online at the American uh, Society of Anesthesiologists uh, website. And it was also published in 19, uh, excuse me, 2013 in its most recent um, rendition. It's a, it's a detailed guide for anesthesia practitioners and any airway practitioner regarding how to proceed in airway management. The algorithm is, is two pages long, it's detailed, complex, comprehensive, and it defines the standard of care in any medical legal battle concerning a hypoxic brain damage. The algorithm is so detailed, complex, and comprehensive that some would say it's impossible to remember every step in an acute occurrence of an airway disaster. A more simplified approach has been touted. One of my professors, Dr. C. Philip Larson, a professor emeritus of anesthesia and neurosurgery at Stanford, and also a prof professor of clinical anesthesiology at UCLA and previous chairman of anesthesia at Stanford, was one of my teachers and mentors for both endotracheal intubation and fibroptic intubation. I met with Dr. Larson uh, two weeks ago and discussed this topic with him, and um, I'm paraphrasing some of his theories and some of his publications in this talk. In a letter to the editor of the Stanford Gas Pipeline in, in May, uh, this is a, a Stanford publication that I write for, in May 2013, Dr. Larson uh, wrote in the letter to the editor, quote, there is no scientific evidence that anesthesia is safer because of the American Society of Anesthesiologists difficult airway algorithm. While it is an interesting educational document, I question the daily clinical value of this algorithm, even its most recent form. The ASA Difficult Airway Algorithm is, um, was developed 
by a committee, and it has all the strengths and weaknesses of this sort of a model. It's complex diffuse, multi-dimensional, and all encompassing, all encompassing, such that it's not an instrument that one can easily adopt and practice in an acute clinical setting. Dr. Larson recommends a system of plans A through D, a system he published in Clinical Anesthesiology, uh, editors uh, Morgan um, and Murray. It's a Lang Medical publication from 2006. The reference is available on their website, the anesthesiaconsultant.com. And it's also being published in a very important textbook, the Anesthesiologist Manual of Surgical Procedures by Richard Jaffe. This is a, a Stanford textbook which is widely read as I, I believe it's the second most important anesthesia textbook in the world, Miller's Anesthesia being number one. And in the appendix, Dr. Larson has um, outlined plans A through D as a simplified approach to error management. This textbook is uh, being published in May of 2014, so it, given that it's March, it's uh, less than hot off the presses. It won't even be out for two months. I'm giving you a little advance um, preview. These are the four plans for, for airway management. If you need to intubate a patient in an operating room, or you could also be doing this if it was an ICU or ER, John, in your previous specialty. Uh, plan A is direct laryngoscopy using uh, a Miller or Macintosh blade. Uh, that's the way that 99% of intubations are done in the operating room, and expert anesthesia professionals have no trouble in accomplishing that most of the time. If plan A is unsuccessful, plan B is the use of video laryngoscopy. There are several excellent video laryng laryngoscopes available. The first one to come out was the GlideScope, and then there's another product called the CMAC. There's a third product called the McGrath 5. All of these products uh, are video screens uh, that give a, uh, an image of what the tip of the laryngoscope is seeing. And the scopes are curved at a much more uh, acute angle than the rigid laryngoscopes we use for plan A. So you can see around corners. The analogy is uh, surgeons have been looking into joints with arthroscopes for many years. Uh, surgeons have been looking into the abdomen with laparoscopes for many years. And now anesthesiologists have the ability to look around corners with video laryngoscopes. We don't need to use them for every intubation. Uh, they're, they have to be clean. There's disposable inserts on some of them. And so there's an added cost to use them for routine. Uh, intubations. However, for difficult intubations, they're very useful. Plan C, if, if plans A and B were unsuccessful, Dr. Larson recommends placing them in the laryngeal mask airway and then link through the laryngeal mask airway and then through that laryngeal mask airway doing a fiber optic intubation. And that's a technique that anesthesia professionals should be comfortable with. Um, it, it consists of threading an endotracheal tube over a fiber optic uh, scope and putting both of them through the LMA. Usually the uh, LMA points right at the larynx, so one can thread the laryngoscope through into the trachea and then thread the endotracheal tube over the, the fiber optic scope into the trachea and blow up the cup. Um, <clears throat> if plans A through C fail, Dr. Larson wrote, one needs plan D. And first, and, and the most prudent, this is exactly what he wrote. He said, the first and perhaps the most prudent option is to cancel proposed operation, terminate anesthesia, and wake a patient up. The operation will be rescheduled for another day, and that time, an awake fiber optic intubation could be done. Alternately, if the surgery cannot be postponed, then the surgeon must be informed that a surgical airway, that is, a tracheostomy, must be performed before the planned operation. And what Dr. Larson wrote is, to date, the utilization of Plan D because of Plans A through C has never occurred in his practice. Dr. Larson wrote that the airway skills involved in Plans A through C should be practiced regularly on patients with normal airways. I can't overemphasize this. If you have a 350-pound patient who's difficult to intubate, that's not the time to do your first video learning scope. It's not the time to do your first uh, fiber optic intubation through a laryngeal mask airway. So routine cases, uh, at a teaching hospital, they teach the residents how to use the video scopes. They teach them how to do fiber optics. And in, in a clinical practice, uh, it's, it's recommended for uh, all anesthesiologists. Rather than the multiple, multiple array of skills that are uh, uh, listed on the difficult airway algorithm, what Dr. Larson recommends is, man is per uh, perfecting the skills in each of these three things 
so that when you get in an emergency, you are dealing with a technique that you are well versed in. I agree with Dr. Larson that in managing difficult airways, a practitioner needs this short list of procedural skills that he or she is expert at, rather than a large array of procedures they rarely use, such as alternate uh, intubation techniques, light wands, line nasal techniques, invasive airway procedures such as retrograde wires passed through a pricothyroid member, or transtracheal jet ventilation through a catheter. It's wise for anesthesiologists to regularly hone their techniques of video laryngoscopy plan B and fiber optic intubation via an LMA and C in patients with normal areas. Regarding um, <clears throat> plan B, an important advance is the availability of portable disposable video laryngoscopes, such as the AirTrack, which is a uh, guided video intubation device. It costs about $100. Um, they're widely available. You can buy a box of six or 12 and um, use them once, and they're supposed to be discarded. Uh, in my hospital settings, we always have a professional video laryngoscope around an AirTrack or a GlideScope. But I, I work in smaller settings at times, uh, offices or small surgery centers that are not stocked with expensive video laryngoscopes. In this, in this case, the best way to handle it is I carry an air trap in my briefcase, and as do my partners. And with this um, technology available in your briefcase, if you encounter an unexpected difficult intubation in an office setting or in any setting where you don't have a video scope with a glide scope, um, you're ready to go with, with plan C, excuse me, plan B. Um, the next point, regarding emergency surgical rescue airway management, Dr. Larson recently published a letter to the editor in the American Society of Anesthesiologists newsletter in February of 2014, so this is just last month, and he titled it, quote, Ditch the Needle, Teach the Knife. In this letter, Dr. Larson wrote, I quote, in that life-threatening airway obstruction, an emergency cricothyrotomy is much quicker, easier, safer, and more effective than any needle-based technique. I can state with confidence that there is no place in emergency airway management for needle-based techniques to establish ventilation. It should be deleted from the ASA difficult airway algorithm. I have participated in seven cricothyrotomies in emergency airway situations, and all of the patients left the hospital without any neurologic injury or complications from the cricothyrotomy. Once again, these are Dr. Larson's words. The risk-benefit ratio is markedly in favor of the knife technique. With a knife or scissors, one cuts quickly down, either vertically or horizontally, below the thyroid cartilage, and there is the cricothyroid membrane or tracheal rings. The knife is inserted into the trachea and turn 90 degrees, and an airway is established. At that point, a small tube of any type can be inserted next to the knife. The knife technique is much safer because there is virtually nothing that one can harm when making an incision in the midline within two inches or less of the midline in the neck, and it can be performed in less than 30 seconds. In contrast, using a needle is fraught with complications, including identifying the trachea, making certain the needle is entirely within the trachea and does not move, to avoid some cutaneous emphysema in which an, when an oxygen high pressure source is established. Uh, <clears throat> establishing a, a pressurized oxygen delivery system can take five minutes or more, even in the most experienced circumstances, and that's a significant disadvantage. And there's also a risk of causing tension in the thorax. Dr. Rice Larson writes, I know of multiple cases of acute airway obstruction where the needle technique was attempted, and in all cases, the patient died. I know of no such cases when a cricothyrotomy was used as the primary treatment for acute airway obstruction. A final note about awake fiber optic intubations, the difficult areas. In hindsight, in any difficult airway case, one often wishes they had secured the endotracheal tube before they anesthetized the patient. The, the difficult problem is deciding prior to a case which patient has a difficult, such a dis difficult airway that the induction of general anesthesia should be delayed until after intubation. In an anesthesia oral board exam, it may be wise to tell the examiner, I will perform an awake intubation on this difficult airway patient rather than risk a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario. Because the examiner was probably poised to skewer you with uh, multiple complications if you tried to intubate a difficult patient in an oral exam. 
Another example, in medical malpractice lawsuits, plaintiff expert witnesses in anesthesia airway disaster cases will often testify that a brain dead patient's life would have been saved if only that anesthesiologist had performed awake intubation rather than inducing general anesthesia first and then losing the airway. The key question is, how does one decide which of those patients needs to have awake intubation? As an anesthesia practitioner, if you performed awake intubations in one out of 50 cases because you were worried that you weren't be able to, to intubate the patient, you would delay, delay multiple operating rooms and surgeons each year because of your caution. You would not be popular if you did this. In my clinical practice, in the practice of the excellent Stanford University anesthesiologists I work alongside of, the prevalence of utilizing awake intubation is low. I estimate most anesthesiologists perform between zero and two awake intubations per year. An anesthesiologist who has a challenging ear, nose, and throat practice with airway abnormalities may do more. <clears throat> um, the most common indications for awake intubations are severe ankylosing spondylitis of the cervical spine, congenital airway anomalies, or severe morbid obesity. Dr. Larson wrote in his letter to the editor of the gas, Stanford Gas Pipeline in May of 2013, quote, I do anesthesia for most of the patients with complex head and neck tumors, and I find fewer and fewer indications for awake fiber optic intubation. As long as the lungs can be ventilated by a bag mask or with an LMA, which is true in almost all sedated patients, Plan C is easier, quicker, and safer than awake fiber optic intubation, both for the patient and for the anesthesia provider. In experienced hands, Plan C can be completed in less than five minutes, and one can become proficient by practicing in normal patients. I have done hundreds of Plan Cs, many under difficult circumstances, without a single failure or complication. Obviously, no technique will encompass every conceivable airway problem, but mastering plans A through D and awake oral and nasal fiber optic intubation will meet the needs of anesthesia providers in almost all circumstances. I hope that you never experience the emotional trauma of a patient having an airway disaster. I urge you to become an expert in bag mask ventilation, to always have access to a video laryngoscope or an air trap, and consider Dr. Larson's plan A through D system, which is described in detail in the appendix on airway management in the newest edition of the Anesthesiologist Manual of Surgical Procedures by Richard Jaffe that will be published in May of 2014. Thank you, John. That's it for tonight. Well, Rick, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you got a lot, of, a lot of information there. And uh, I know that uh, probably most ER departments would, would like to hear a lecture like that. Uh, do you you come lecture the ER docs? Um, you know, I don't because my at, at my university hospital, they have a team of very excellent ear, nose, and throat uh, anesthesiologists who are considered the local airway experts, um, and th they they do the lecturing to the to the ER docs if they are. Any. Um, I um, certainly could handle the lectures, but I'm a broad-based anesthesiologist in many interests. Uh, it's not my specific. Lecture. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think I may have mentioned it the other week. With uh, there's some some doctors I know that personally will not work in the ER only because they're deadly afraid of a difficult intubation. You know, the the rest of the ER work, trauma, etc., it won't bother them. But the minute that you say to some doc, I know two doctors that refuse to work in the ER. They're good doctors in other areas, but they just refuse to. But uh, now, do you always have that video laryngoscope at, on hand? Is that always within reach for you in the OR? Yes. Now, at a university hospital, yes. At a community hospital, yes. And most of our surgery centers. But smaller surgery centers and offices, locations where perhaps there is one operating room, uh, no. Uh, the, the capital outlay, you're looking at several thousand dollars for one of these. Um, a new one. I, a, the last time we bought one for our surgery center was it was five thousand dollars for McGrath five, and when smaller facilities are looking at the bottom line and thinking how often are we going to need this and they don't buy it, but you as the anesthesia practitioner um, may choose to bring the portable device which is only one hundred dollars. 
okay. A lot of the patient planning, you don't want, you don't plan to have a patient with an abnormal airway in a, an office practice. You don't plan to have it in a small surgery center practice. But you be, can be fooled. You can have somebody come in who the surgeon thought was normal, and you talk to the patient on the phone, but in the community practice of office-based medicine, it's not common to have a preoperative anesthesia clinic, so you are going to meet the patient for the first time that day. And you may uh, find when you meet them that they have a small mandolin, they have a small mouth, maybe they had some radiation to their neck. For whatever reason, the mouth doesn't open normally, and uh, the airway could be more challenging and necessitate the plan B equipment. Okay, um, okay Rick, uh, can you tell a difficult intubation just by looking at a person and your experience? Most of them or or, or visualizing their, their airway? Most of the time, John. When you're going, walking through a shopping mall, you can see individuals walking by and you think, well, I'm, I wouldn't want to see that guy uh, for an emergency <laughs> surgery at 1 in the morning. And these are usually people who have thick necks, uh, morbidly obese, uh, a large Santa Claus beard doesn't help because it's difficult to mask ventilation. The other subtype is people who have um, very small chins, their chins recede, and they have congenital, generally abnormal airways where the mouths don't open. The, um, but sometimes you can be surprised. Each year, uh, one or two times a year, I have somebody who's very difficult to visualize the larynx where I had no um, suspicion that that would be the case at all. And the reason being just their necks don't extend as well after they're paralyzed as you thought they would. And what we're looking for is to have a straight line between my eyeball and the patient's larynx. And uh, you can't see around the corner if the, uh, the patient's neck uh, doesn't extend uh, properly. Okay, that kind of leads me to the next question. Uh, when you have an obese person and, you, and you're considering either a tracheostomy or a cricothyrotomy, um, you, are you always able to palpate the, the, the cricoid cartilage in someone that's very obese? It can be very difficult. And I, nobody, despite what I just said about doing uh, plan D and doing the surgical airway, nobody wants to try to do a surgical airway on a morbidly obese patient who is hypoxic and desaturated. So if you, um, if you think that the patient is going to be difficult to intubate and they might be difficult to mass ventilate and you might wind up with a surgical airway, those are the small number of patients that you may just do an awake fiber optic on. Um, I have never done a surgical airway uh, on a patient uh, in an operator. I've done over 20,000 anesthetics, and I hope that it stays at zero. I know how to do it if I had to because I've done injections into the cricothyroid. I know the anatomy, and uh, I think, as Dr. Larson wrote, if you make, if you can feel the anatomy and the neck is, is slender enough, you make a slice there and you put a number six endotracheal tube with a cuff on it, push it through, that's going to save you more than sticking any 14-gauge needles in there. It's a, it's a preferred technique if you need a surgical airway. Um, they make cricothyrotomy kits, but I'm telling you, they're sitting in drawers and people never use them, and the, the first time to use something is not an emergency if you haven't practiced. Um, but I think that just an incision and a regular endotracheal tube, as Dr. Larson wrote, if you need a surgical airway, it would be the highest likelihood to be successful. Well, you know, in the emergency circles, the, the last I, I kind of covered it was uh, there's still a place for cricothyroid needle cricothyroidomies, especially. Right. In but I guess he, uh, the doctor you were mentioning says they have no place. They should be taken off uh, the protocol, correct? Yeah, and I, I, in my experience, I have not seen any good outcomes with that technique. I, um, I would not use it. I would not recommend it. So just in the books, I guess classically. And one last question, Rick, uh, on the wake intubation. You anesthet does a person get Valium or some kind of sedative or curare or succinylcholine or something, or is it just strictly awake, not no meds? No, that's a good question. There, that has to be uh, practiced and learned because there's technique to that too. We we will administer supplemental oxygen, usually nasal, uh, and then give intravenous sedation. The sedation is titration of. Uh, narcotic and benzodiazepine, typically small doses of midazolam, small doses of fentanyl, getting the patient sleepier and sleepier so they don't care, but they have to stay uh, well oxygenated. And once they're, at, while they're in the process of getting sedated, spray the throat with typically we use cetacane, 
um, you can use lidocaine and block the um, the uh, the laryngeal nerves, the superior laryngeal nerves from the, from the side of the neck. And we like to do um, a 4% uh, lidocaine transtracheal spray. You can put that in the back of the tongue and spray that in the posterior area behind the, the tongue. Or, or in addition to um, injecting a transtracheal injection with a small needle of some 4% lidocaine into the trachea. Once all those things have done, been done, the, we'll put a, the, the typical technique is to use a, a, an oral intubating airway. It's, it's, uh, it's pink and it's hollow. And you put it in the patient's mouth and have them suck on it. With all that topicalization and sedation, you hope it doesn't make them gag. Insert the fiber optic scope um, through that airway with the endotracheal tube over the scope. And as long as you stay in the midline, you can usually find the, um, the larynx and thread it through there. The advantage of using the transtracheal lidocaine is that when you do pass the tube through the cords into the trachea, the patient will not uh, develop a heart rate of 140 and blood pressure 200 over 130 because it's so, so stimulating to intubate a completely awake patient. It's a skill that has to be practiced, but um, it, um, that's how we do it. Okay, Rick. Uh... Very good. That's a lot of good information, and I know a lot of ear docs would love to hear a, a, a talk like that, uh, because we certainly all want to avoid the disasters concerning uh, airways uh, in any part of the hospital, uh, including the operating room. So, thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Thanks, and good night. Time. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Good night.